Welcome back to the My Story in Motorsport podcast, and today we're going to be speaking to Formula 2 driver Bent Viscull. Now, this was recorded in 2020 as he was gearing up for a campaign in Formula 3, and while it had its ups and downs, he got onto the podium twice, including an impressive victory at the Great British Round. Now, as I said, this was recorded in 2020, so I've edited out a couple of questions which were in reference to that season in particular. But as we go into the 2021 season, he's racing with Trident in Formula 2. And if the first round in Bahrain is anything to go by, he's going to have a pretty impressive year after a really strong pace with very limited testing. Nonetheless, let's speak to Ben Viscal about everything up to this point. This is Ben Viscal's Motorsport Story. So Ben, if we look back to your early career, uh, what got you into motorsport? Did you have any sort of like early inspirations? Uh, good question that is. Um, so no, actually I got a go-kart for my birthday when I was five. So that's how I got into the sport. Initially I was more interested in football than racing. Uh, but at the age of nine or ten, I actually decided that racing would be more fun. Then I did my first competitions and you know it all started from there on really but it all started with a birthday present oh wow okay so it was was it kind of your parents idea to get the car or no, so, were yeah, you kind of pushing to not at all not at all i was very happy <laughs> playing football but then because my father actually did uh super cards, so you know the very fast ones on uh the 250 two stroke ones the those people are mental actually you know the speeds they go with a go-kart is absolutely insane. So he used to do that, but just more for a hobby. And um, yeah, actually, oh, I forgot to tell as well, I wanted to do motocross first as well, but my mother wouldn't let me do that because it was too dangerous. Uh, so yeah, then I ended up uh, go-karting. Well, that's fair enough. I understand why motocross is definitely a bit more dangerous, but <laughs> you've got to the point now where I guess motorsport is quite dangerous, you know, at those sort of speeds, so, yeah. It doesn't really um, matter now, does it? The motocross or yeah. F3, is, uh, it's all about the same. Yeah, true, true. Um, so how, how did you sort of enjoy those first moments in karting? Did you get on with it straight away, or did, you, did it take a bit of time to actually really enjoy it? I don't remember much of it, but I remember... So there was always a Sunday morning, uh, like there were two hours for mini cards at the track. I always went like 60 kilometers away from here. Uh, the rest of the day was always with the case of two cards and the, the, you know, the proper adults on track. So going there with a mini card was always a bit dangerous. So I remember that my father and I always went uh, together, you know, the, at 7 a.m. Sunday morning, basically every Sunday morning, even if he had a party the day before we went. Didn't matter what weather it was, we just went for two hours straight uh, just to do go-karting. And I really enjoyed it, even if the weather was awful, which was most of the time uh, the case in the Netherlands, of course. As you're from the UK, you probably understand. Yeah, pretty uh, similar. <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't want to miss a single minute of driving those two hours. I mean, I was a bit scared if the, the adults came on track because it was more like hobby drivers, so they didn't really have a clue what they were doing. And they were just overtaking me on the straights and I tried to get them back in the corners. But uh, yeah, so I basically enjoyed every single minute of it and I didn't stop since then, really. I'm still as passionate as back then. Awesome, awesome. That's, that's great to hear because I guess some people probably lose interest at some point because you do karting for so many years, don't you? I mean, even if it's not racing, you probably, don't, I don't know, I assume probably about 10 years around that long? Um... You mean go-karting for 10 years? Yeah, well, um, pretty much, mm, so from 5 till 16, so yeah, 11, 11, 11 years, basically. And I still do it, of course, when uh, when the tracks are open and we've got time. Yeah, I guess you don't have so, so much yeah. time nowadays. <laughs> but um, I'd like to quickly touch on the cost of karting, because to some people, maybe like myself, I can just go to a track and do 30 minutes for... 30 euros in your case whatever but when you're doing it properly how expensive does it get because i've heard it gets nearly as expensive or maybe more expensive than actually car racing yeah i've, I've heard that recently as well that the price of go-karting went up a lot but i think it's 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 a bit like how expensive do you want to make it i mean i think it's with every sport the case i mean you can do hobby karting for i mean probably the same price as you would go for golfing more or less for the subscription of a golf course. But uh, yeah, I also heard the budgets of uh, 
the top teams in go-karting right now, which is, it probably even doubled to the time I was driving, which is four or five years ago. So you can imagine how that went up, which is a bit concerning, I think. Uh, I don't think that's necessary, uh, but we always did it more or less with a private team. Okay, we did it together with KSM, CRG Holland, but it, it was always more for fun than anything else, to be honest. And, and we really enjoyed it. We always went there by ourselves as well with the camper and then, you know, mm-hmm. most of us <laughs> ourselves. Well, that's a nice story. Um, so when you started winning championships and, you know, being really competitive against other drivers in, you know, massive teams, was that quite a big sort of standout moment for you? Because in a way you were kind of still the underdog at that point. Um, well, th- so there were like two moments in my go kart career that were uh, that stood out. So it was first a mini, mini, uh, so really small um, mini car championship. So I won the Dutch championship in my second year. Uh, that was the first real nice experience of go karting. Uh, after that, I had two, maybe even three very bad years of go karting because I was very small. Even when I left the mini cars, I had still 10 kilos of extra weight on the mini cars. So I made a step to the junior category. Uh, So at some point we were running 30 kilos of extra weight on the cart, which was actually more than my own weight. Uh, And you can probably already guess how that went on tracks like La Cunca and and stuff like that. So, but we still enjoyed it. We still had fun, but uh, yeah. But when I really got into it, it was actually in 2015 in juniors because I finally grew. I was still one of the smallest, but still, it was competitive. We also switched chassis back, back then uh, to Tony Kart. And then we won the German Championship. Uh, we're competitive in the European World Championships. So those moments really stand out for me. Um, and of course, the first KZ2 experience, you know, the shifter card was something that still stands out. I mean, the, the power those cards have is uh, insane. So I'd like to maybe you know, take your wisdom here for for drivers that want to get into karting. I mean, I do it amateur, you know, level just for fun, and I know a lot of other people do as well. How how did you go about it to sort of get quick quickly? If that makes any sense, how how did you go about that first process? You mean when I was very young, or when I was doing the junior categories, or I guess when you sort of started taking it more seriously. How how did you go about making sure you were quick? Was it just getting more and more track time in is that the most important thing uh i think it's not about how much time you put in but what you put in the time if that makes sense so it's not it's not necessarily okay i'm gonna do it of course helps to do many many hours in the cars but it makes sense to do it sensible and with a clear goal so every every minute is spent well um but when i first started of course i didn't really have a clue i just went and had fun (laughs) <laughs> I mean, later on you learn the techniques to just be more efficient on track, of course. But uh, yeah, when you start off as an eight-year-old, you don't really think about any of that, to be honest. It was just about having fun. Cool. And uh, I guess one of the things I'll be interested in about sort of more professional karting is how much data do they give you nowadays? I mean, is it like Formula Renault, for example, or Formula 4, or is it still quite basic? Uh, data, I mean, like mm. telemetry. Yeah, telemetry, like, I guess more than just lap times, basically. Oh, yeah, so it, it's a little bit more limited than formula cars because, um, for example, it's it's hard. I don't even know. I mean, I'm, I'm out for four years now, actually, out of the karting stuff. But I know the biggest thing we've been trying to find with KSM was always to have a brake pressure sensor on it. But it was always more or less impossible because... It's not like a racing car where you can just put a sensor in between. So that was the most limiting factor. Also, the steering angle was pretty difficult most of the times. But what you do have is the GPS, uh, so you can see lines. It's pretty accurate nowadays, I think. Um, G-forces, of course, uh, and just wheel speed. I think those were the basic, basic files you looked into, but not much more than that. So when you sort of started winning the German Championship, for example, I guess that was, as you say, probably the biggest moment in karting for you. Was that the sort of moment or around that time when you realised, I need to make the step to cars now, I'm ready? Uh, funny, of, funny enough, not at all. Even at that, at that point, I started quite late in cars as well. I mean, I started when I was 16, probably even 17. I just turned 17, I think. Um, but it was never really the aim to go 
in professional motorsport, Formula 4, Formula 3. Uh, it was always more or less the aim to be in the family business someday. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so I won the championship. I got the Formula 4 test because of that. And yeah, the test went well. So on the back of that, it kind of escalated very quickly. And, you know, that was my first year in F4. So it was a bit incidental, I have to say. I, I didn't really, I mean, when I won that, I still thought, okay, that's a, that's a nice story to have. Uh, but never like, okay, now I'm gonna gonna make the step to cars or whatever. It, we never ever thought like this. Wow, okay. So that's interesting to know. I mean, um, thankfully you made the decision to come to cars because obviously you've had some, quite a lot of success since then. Um, but how big of a decision was that in 2017 when you made that first jump? into single-seaters with Formula 4? Were you nervous at all, or did you think natural progression at this point? Um, well, compared to go karting, I think the competitiveness of an F4 car is maybe a little bit less than the actual world, world Championship or European Karting Championship and Junior Karts. So it, it, it wasn't really a shock in terms of level. But of course, it took a bit of adaptation to get used to the downforce, to get used to the bigger tracks of course i mean i remember the first test i spun on my first lap uh because i was complete i mean i didn't know the brake pedal was that stiff so i just touched it like a normal karting brake and, and the car didn't stop so i panicked and just went on with two like both of my feet on it and then i spun so yeah it takes a bit of time to adjust but to be fair i think if you're quick in go-karts you kind of make that step quite easily to to an f4 car because i've heard that some people really struggle between that that step between cars uh, sorry carts and cars is it does the grip sort of hit you the brakes hit you or, or is it all quite similar to sort of a top end go-kart nowadays the, yeah so basically the brakes are the most powerful um also the wind noise is very much there i mean you don't really think about downforce at all in in go-karts but formula 4 is really the first taste of a downforce and, and drag and slipstreaming and, and I think that's the biggest difference between between the two of them uh, that you really need to go faster to gain more grip uh, to say it like that it's that's the that's the biggest shock I would say okay interesting interesting so you made the decision to race in Spain and also the Northern European Championship in Formula 4 uh, why did you decide to go there so you're you're obviously from the Netherlands was there any thoughts of doing something like Formula Renault, for example, which maybe would have been a bit closer to heart? Mm, I, we never actually considered Formula Renault in the first year. I mean, it was always going to be F4. It was more a decision between German F4 and like the, 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 the different F4 championships, but we decided to go with the NES F4 championship and the Spanish one, which, uh, funny enough, was actually one of the races from the NES was in Assen which is like 40 minutes from my house, so it, it, that, that was more or less the home race. Okay, I didn't realise that. I didn't look down the full championship, so it's good to see that you actually did get a home race in there. But, you know, two successful campaigns. Um, I think it was over 10 wins in both of them combined, so any big reflections on that year? I guess quite a successful first step into the world of motorsport cars. Um, yeah, so... It, it was a very learnful year, of course. I mean, uh, the, the the start of the season, I struggled a little bit, especially the second and third race. Uh, from winter testing on, it was very quick, so that was never really the issue. Um, but I finally started winning races consistently towards the end of the year. Um, so that means we made a step on driving and whatever towards the end of the season, which is always good to see the progression. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Basically. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so, I guess at the end of that campaign, you've had, I think, two runner-up positions, or was it for a second and a third, or a second and a second? No, yeah, they're, they're funny enough, it, 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 they're, sometimes it says on Wikipedia, for example, it says the right way around, I think it's uh, two second places, so twice vice champion, basically. Yeah, because I was a bit confused, because I, I looked on two different places, and I see two different, <laughs> two different results, so... I guess it's better that it's two runners up at least. But um, after that, a great year. What was your thoughts about going into 2018? Were any sort of big teams in contact with you, asking you to race with them in uh, 2018? Uh, well, the, the normal step would be to go to Formula Renault after that, from F4 to Formula Renault, or maybe even Euro Formula. But it wasn't that common 
normally, especially not from an F1 nest point of view. Um, but yeah, of course, we were in contact with more teams to do Formula Renault or Euro Formula. Um, but I kind of prefer the Euro Formula car because it's just one of the best Formula cars to drive, to be honest, with the Michelin tires, with the downforce you had, uh, the car itself was very nice to drive. So I, we felt like that was the best car to develop my racecraft and, and race skills. And I think you were the rookie champion that year as well, finished second in the championship. I mean, it, in my head, going from a Formula 4 to a insanely quick Formula 3 car, did it take much time to adapt, as you say? Or was it, once again, just it all kind of worked? It's uh, funny enough, it took uh, probably f five or six laps, and then it was already like normal. So it's, it's not like, uh, the, the thing is, a Formula 3 car makes more sense than an F4 car. So it's, it's closer to a go-kart, if that makes sense for you. It's like uh, uh, the inputs you do make more sense. So it's, it's easier to understand what's going on. I mean, those cars, I think, as you mentioned there, uh, I think a lot of people see that Formula 3 car as one of the best single seaters ever made. How, how did you... How did you take in that year? Because I guess you've only done one year in that car. So what was your favorite moment, maybe favorite track to drive that car around? Well, um, favorite track, well, uh, I can think of one specific corner that really stood out was uh, Pujol and Spa, so the fast left-hander. Um, so in quali, it was just, just about flat in that car. So you can imagine with every other car you need to shift down maybe once, maybe twice. So with that car it was flat and downhill, uh, just magical to be honest. Um, also the slipstream effect was huge, especially in Monza I remember, I think it was one second if you took the slipstream or not. So uh, yeah, I think in terms of racing those cars provided some, some of the best, I think. So you came, as I said, runner-up in that championship. I think the the guy that won it, um, he, I think, had quite a bit more time in that car than you. So is it one of those sort of situations where he's got a lot more experience in these cars? Was it kind of expected he, he would have that advantage? No, I, I mean, Philippe um, was always... Um, I mean, he did two years of F4, if I remember well. And then he went into Euro Formula with RP Motorsport, which was back then the most uh, successful team until then. But I felt very comfortable with uh, Theo Martin Motorsport, but I still knew we had to close a little bit of a gap in terms of car performance. And, and we came there by the end of the year, uh, also towards the middle, but I knew it was going to take a little bit of time. Um, but yeah, it's just one of those gambles you take I, I guess in racing and, I, and I'm very happy that I did it because I learned so much about car development about how the team works about uh, even even how international people work differently to national people like Spanish people the culture is different than the Dutch culture uh, yeah so I, I think it was a very good decision to go with Theo Martin so it was a great year I guess the natural step was to go to I guess at the time it was GP3, but it switched to Formula 3 uh, the year after. Um, I guess there's a lot of bidding that goes on here to try and get one of the top, top, top drives, but you went with HWA. That was their first season, wasn't it, with the Formula 3 car? So did you kind of expect it to be a, a bit of a challenge, you know, developing a car once again that was probably not going to be right at the top? Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's always a bit of a, I mean, because the cars were new, um, you didn't really know what car was the most competitive one and uh, yeah it, we felt we felt very comfortable with the HWA to be in in a very good position to fight for for podiums etc okay well we struggled especially towards the end of the season um, me in particularly uh, but yeah sometimes it works out sometimes it doesn't work out in these single seasons uh, you know the junior categories are always uh, yeah, probably one of the most difficult ones to be consistent as a team as well. So yeah, you, you kind of need to understand that it will not only, it will not always be as straightforward as it looks. 
I mean, there's kind of trends I find in, in motorsport. I mean, in England, the best sort of single-seater team is Carlin. And then in Formula 3 for a number of years, it was Prima, GP3, had ART. Was it always a bit maybe frustrating to sort of go into a weekend knowing they would always maybe have that slight set of advantage that you'd have to claw back somehow? Yeah, it, it was always a bit... Um... Yeah, it, I think it's, it's, it was the same for everyone. At some point, Prema did pole position uh, by probably three or four tenths to the to, <laughs> to P4. So you'd always kind of know that, uh, that it, it would be difficult to go for uh, the first places. But still, you want to get the best out of yourself. You still want to develop the car as much as possible. But uh, yeah, sometimes it was frustrating, of course, to see that. So there was a strong fifth place in France. There were some other good performances that ultimately didn't get you into the points. But would you look at the year as a whole as a great learning year? I mean, the Pirelli tyres I hear are not the easiest thing to get on with, especially if you haven't driven on them before. Um, yeah, so it, I mean, it's I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that the the second race in France was. I mean, the best race, but it was also quite early on in the year. So in terms of progression, I'm probably not that happy uh, because, of course, towards the end of the season, I would have liked to be progressing more or at least stay at the same level. But I didn't I didn't really come close to that finishing position anymore. So that uh, it was a bit of a, yeah, a very learnful year because, of course, you know what went wrong, you know what you did wrong what, what you probably could have changed on the car what you i mean you will always find it out later on but at that moment of course you're a little bit frustrated that it doesn't go the way you want to go uh, that you want to have it go um but yeah again a very learnful year that's for sure um and then over the winter this one just gone you went over to india the mrf challenge so you did four races you won two of them i guess that was a nice way to reset for the new year yeah, so that was a bit of a last-minute thing, really, uh, because I didn't do Macau, and the last time I'd been in a car was actually in the Valencia test, which was in the beginning of October. So, uh, yeah, I, I had to do some track time somehow, so uh, we thought that that might have been, uh, that would have been a good good thing to just gain some range craft and then get back to a car again. Of course, it's nothing like a Formula 3 car, but at least, you know, you get back in the rhythm. Um, and it was a very good experience, actually. Uh, okay, yeah, I won two of the races. It was good, was good fun to fight with uh, David. Uh, and yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. And we, and we won twice as well. So that's, it was a lot of fun. So in this downtime, um, I've noticed, especially you've been doing a lot of sim racing. Um, when did you start getting into gaming? Uh, was this, you know, I don't think it is, but I assume it was something that started a long time ago rather than just buying iRacing, you know, a couple of months ago. Um, well, iRacing, more or less, yes. Um, but, of course, with friends, I was probably... Uh, so, for example, FIFA, the football game, I already had it since 2003. The first edition was 2003, and now it's 2020. So I've got all the editions since then. So I'm a bit of a... I'm a, I'm a gamer, yes. Call of Duty, FIFA... Uh, F1 games, of course, especially on the Xbox. That's why I knew you, of course, because I watched some videos back then. Um, I mean, I always had a lot of fun with friends playing play do playing those kind of games. Grand Theft Auto, of course, one of the best ones. Um, but yeah, iRacing, of course, is a little bit more professional. And it's really used to get you sharp, get you, you know, back into the race rhythm again, or stay in it rather than... Uh, get back into it uh but yeah i racing i took i racing seriously since one month i think not before that it's not like i did uh, a lot of races or i just did it more for fun and now i just i just started to uh yeah i mean pick it up more seriously uh yeah i had to update a lot of stuff because i hadn't been using it for a year probably but it's still the best way to keep you fit and sharp I mean, when you cannot do any kilometers. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to get onto iRacing racing in a minute. Um, one thing before that is, as you as you mentioned, I find that crazy that you watched my videos back in the day, or at least a few of them. So that's kind of crazy. Um, but secondly, how 
awesome is it to think that maybe you might be in a Formula One game in the next couple of years? Yeah, uh, so whether the, they bring in F3 or <laughs> that's they a, put in F2. That, 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 that's always uh, one of those things. I mean, it's, it's funny that you mention because normally you would always do the career modes on F1 or even MotoGP game. Uh, and then you would always see the Red Bull rookies in the MotoGP who are already featured in and the Moto3, Moto2, MotoGP. Um, so yeah, hopefully they will do uh, Formula 3 for the next year. So I will be in the in the game because that, that's always one of those uh, things you really want to uh, want to have happen. Oh, that'd be awesome. Well, hopefully that does happen. Um, I'd like to go back to sort of more simulator games uh, now with maybe your thoughts on what is the best simulator. I mean, people say iRacing, some people say R Factor. Have you got any thoughts on this or is it is it iRacing for you? There are always pros and cons for both, uh, I think. I think iRacing is the easiest platform to just join a race uh, and just get racing with some proper fast people. Um, I don't really have a lot of experience with R Factor or Assetto Corsa or any of that. Um, but I think the car model in Assetto Corsa and Air Factor is a little bit better than iRacing, so the physics make more sense. But again, it's just so much easier to go through iRacing and, and just join a race, whether it's in a Formula 3 or GT or whatever. It's just, I think, the best platform to, to really enjoy yourself. So, so the strangest thing was actually the, the first race we did was in Daytona with the F3 car. And I, I didn't actually realize I was going to have a proper race that evening. I didn't even know it was going to be on a live stream, to be honest. So then uh, first, I mean, I just saw all these names being in the server, which was pretty strange. And then uh, seeing that I was actually in the top five most of the time was actually very fun. Uh, but as I said, I was just having fun on iRacing with friends, just like basically the whole week before because of the quarantine and everything. You couldn't do much else than that. Uh, and then all of a sudden you do this race with all of these names, which is, which is, yeah, as you say, pretty strange, pretty surreal. Uh, but on the other hand, it doesn't feel much different than a normal iRace. As I said, I didn't even realize it was streamed live. <laughs> well, okay, I didn't know that either. That's, that's kind, of, kind of funny. Um, actually, interesting, maybe just speaking about Max there, has he... Or you know him getting to Formula One, being successful, or whatever, has that changed the view of motorsport in Holland at all? I mean, I don't really have that insider perspective, but I assume maybe you've got more support and more people are speaking about you because of it. Um, I think motorsport in general has risen in the Netherlands over the last five years because of Verstappen being in F1. Basically, um, before that, I don't really think it was that popular in the Netherlands. Um, MotoGP would probably m be more popular because of the Dutch Grand Prix or the Dutch TT actually in Assen. Um, but yeah, it, it just exploded in the Netherlands after he won his first race basically. And, and of course, uh, the whole world of motorsport benefits from it. Uh, of course, the Netherlands didn't do too well on the last World Cup and European football championship. So that's that probably everyone was switching to motorsport for a couple of years. But fortunately, we are uh, getting back into the World Cups again with the football team. <laughs> um, I'd like to quickly maybe just speak about, you know, what you're doing with iRacing now, because you, I assume you were spending quite a lot of time in the simulator now. Are you, how, how many hours a day, maybe? Maybe you don't want to say it, but how many, how many hours are you spending maybe each day on it now? Yeah, it depends if, if I mean, if you have something to do Apart from eye racing, of course, it's probably two hours, but it's never really a, a consistent plan or whatever. But it can be up to five hours some days where you just go in the morning, you do something in the afternoon and then you do something in the in the evening. But I had to make a stop at some point in the, in the at night because especially the first week or two hours going until two or three a.m which is common, you know, I mean, you don't want to stop. I mean, you just keep going, keep going. But now at some point you need to say, okay, now no, it's enough. Otherwise your rhythm is just all over the place. So the, that's something I had to learn, but I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. Uh, what bits to you as a racing driver are super realistic and what bits, you know, still need to be worked on, would you say? Well, um, for me, uh, the setting up of the cars is quite, quite interesting. I mean, it doesn't always make sense to be honest you know it's it's sometimes a little bit all over the place 
Um, but yeah, you just get a base set up and then you just try to be as fast as possible with that. You do back-to-back -back tests to, to improve the setup, which is a lot of fun and realistic. But um, not everything about it is good, uh, especially the last couple of weeks. Uh, I think net coding is, uh, no, net coding is quite a big problem. Uh, I just crashed out of two races. I didn't even come close to him, but it just hit me in some kind of glitch. So that's something they really have to improve because that costs a lot of eye rating in the end of the day. And I mean, everyone gets competitive at some point and, and, and you don't, you don't want to get off in a race when it doesn't make sense, of course. Mm. So last couple of questions, you know, back to real racing, you know, where's the ultimate goal right now? Because obviously, you know, if it's a successful year in F3, I guess progression to F2, a couple of years in there. I guess Formula One's still the ultimate aim? Um, yes, it is, uh, definitely. I mean, I think it is for everyone in F3. I, it, I think it has to be for everyone in F3 uh, because it's the pinnacle of motorsport. And, you know, I think it's every boy's dream to be in F1 someday. So in terms of racing at home, I mean, we don't know with the rescheduling what exactly is going to happen, but... The Dutch Grand Prix this year, I guess that's quite exciting for you to be on that support package and I assume lots of family there to cheer you on? Um, yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if it will happen this year, but uh, it will be very special, of course. Uh, Zandvoort itself, I, I actually haven't been there uh, to do a proper test or anything. I mean, I've done some laps with a random car, but not, uh, not an actual race. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's special because, as I said, five years ago, a Dutch Grand Prix would probably be laughed at. I mean, it's, it's not something that would be taken seriously. And now it's just, I mean, it was sold out in no time. I think there were one million people on the waiting list to get a ticket, which is, which is incredible. I mean, they literally had to pick people out of the, out of the list. Uh, I'm not sure if that happened to any Grand Prix. Uh, ever so you can you can imagine how how popular it is in the Netherlands at the moment and it would be very special of course to race at that event um, as a Dutchman it's great to see hopefully it all does go ahead um, as I'd like to finish off by asking as you've been so successful in this eye racing thing over the last couple of uh, weeks and months now what advice would you have to any new guys which are getting into it for the first time because I guess with the quarantine loads of people are trying out eye racing how would you approach it as a rookie now and, and a professional racing driver, I guess? Uh, I think it sounds a bit cliche, but just have fun. I mean, you cannot expect to be on the pace straight away if you download the game. I mean, it's, it's just unrealistic to say that, okay, I've never done any sim stuff or maybe I've done some F1 2019, but I expect to be on the pace within two weeks on iRacing. That's probably not going to happen that easily, uh, but just enjoy it just look for the best setups of course because they make quite a big difference although i would i would probably start off with a fixed setup series like the formula sprint or the bmw sprint series just just because it's it's more fair for everyone yeah i've been trying the bmws um i did a bit of the formula 3 as well i'm still not super quick in either of them but you know once you get into the right lobby sometimes it works out but um yeah thank you for your advice and thank you for the great stories uh, in this one and obviously you guys can go and follow uh, bent's uh, social medias and all that and follow his journey this year but uh, yeah thank you so much for your time and uh, best of luck thank you as well alex i will be watching your videos in the future as well <laughs> cool cheers thank you <laughs>